So that only half an hour of the session is going to be us talking, the rest is going to be you discuss So let me introduce my three speakers. Um, you're, you're on. Uh, I can't sit down, so I'm not good. You can't sit down? Okay, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> There's always someone who can't sit down. <laughs> okay, we're going to have our presenters wandering around. So we have Matthias Matthias from HP. We have Stephen Downs from the National Research Council of Canada. And we have Mark West from UNESCO in Paris. So Matthias is um, from Brazil, he's based in the US. Stephen from Canada. I'm from the UK, and Mark is from France, and they're all from the middle. <laughs> but you guys are going to contribute a lot from your perspective, from your part of the world, I hope. So, um, I'm going to start with Stephen. He's our first speaker. And um, Stephen will say a little bit more about what he does before he starts his speech. Okay, thank you. I should stand. Yes. Yeah. Alright, so just so you know, um, as I always do, I'm recording this, so uh, uh, the video will be focused up here, but there is audio on the recording, so don't say anything you'll regret. <laughs> Think of your future political career. <laughs> um, so, thanks uh, for this. I have a career because in 1998 I wrote a paper called The Future of Online Learning. And that paper turned out to be, well, right. <laughs> um, I talked about modularizing content, um, I talked about the use of multimedia, I talked about learning management systems, and all of that. And just the ways that technology would transform the way that we learn. One of the things that made the future of online learning successful as a paper, at least in my estimation, was that I focused not only on the technology, because that's the easy part, but also on the social, cultural, and environmental factors. So to me, for example, it's not at all a surprise that we would have an internet that costs billions and billions of dollars and we would use it to send cat pictures to each other. Um, it totally makes sense to me. Um, and so I think that when we're looking at the future of learning and the future of education today, we need to be thinking not just of the technology, but also of these other factors. Now, there was a slide uh, during the plenary this morning by the speaker from the uh, Clay, uh, Christensen Institute. And I'm sorry I forget his name, I've got it written down. But I have a very good memory, but it's short. Um, and the slide said that there will be, as I recall, 450,000 or 450 million people uh, who are employable in Africa in 2035 and 100 million jobs. I, I think that's kind of optimistic, actually. Um, I think that in, in societies where there's even more automation, this might be even more extreme. Uh, you know, in 2035, especially in industrialized societies, but I think all over, we're going to have a significant surplus of people. Uh, more people than there are jobs. So the, the, probably the crucial question that we're going to have to address is not how to give everybody jobs, not how to train people for stuff, um, you know, not to train people for jobs that will be done by a machine in 2035. That makes no sense. Um, we're going to have to focus on whatever it is that we can do to make people uh, more able to fend for themselves in the sense of having greater agency, having greater capacities. Uh, some people say having greater s critical s thinking skills and things like that. But, you know, I don't want to say life skills because that's wrong, it's too narrow. 
But the idea of focusing training on specific jobs and specific employment opportunities will have the result of training people for jobs that don't exist. At least that's my perception. And I think that in order to make this happen, and this has been a theme that I've had for a number of years now, we need to focus less on what uh, industry and politicians think that people should be educated in and more on what people themselves think that their own education should be. And we're seeing this as a shift overall as informal learning becomes more and more prevalent and formal learning in universities and other institutions becomes less and less prevalent. Um, the traditional way of teaching through universities is expensive um, and if it weren't for the fact that they offer degrees, nobody would go to them. Well, a few people would go to them, right? You know, if they had a lot of money, you'd go to them. Um, what we're seeing even now is that uh, people are using access to information and access to the internet to teach themselves whatever it is that they want to learn when they want to learn it. And the objective is typically not to amass a certain body of knowledge, but to get something done. So in a sense, it's just in time kind of learning, but it's just in time learning, it's informal learning, it's not evaluated, it's often not credentialed. And you might ask, well, how will we know that people are qualified at doing whatever they want to do? And the answer will be in their work. More and more what we do is we work online. And even if we work offline, there's a digital imprint in what we do. And by 2035, with artificial intelligence, we will be able to use tools like this to look at a person's online presence and determine by that work whether they are an educator, whether they are a dentist, whether they are a plumber. And so the credentials would be much less important than the actual evidence of their capacities and skills. So we need to focus on mechanisms, first of all, to develop those capacities and skills people choosing their own learning to get things done, and then secondly, on these um, systems that allow us to be able to look at somebody's online presence and understand what it is that they're capable of doing. And then if there are jobs to match them to, to match them to those jobs. But last word, this is one part. Education is only one part in a much more complex story. Um, again, you know, the, the person from the Christensen Institutes talking about all you really need to do is educate people in developing markets and everything will be great. It doesn't work that way. I'm sure you know it doesn't work that way. Education is what I would call a necessary but not sufficient condition. And there are a host of other social, economic, political, medical, and other challenges that need to be addressed as well. Uh, and education is only one part of it. Finally, anyone who uses the session to advertise a product will be criticized. Just kidding. <laughs> 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 thank, thank you, Stephen. I'm going to take this. I'm going to take one question now, or should we wait until everyone's finished? Whatever people would like to do, I am at your disposal. Okay. Does anyone have a burning question, or would they like to relate to the other side? I think you can then pull the threads together. I can't see that down there. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Oh, okay, we have one. Okay, let's just take that one then. Uh, I think it's Stephen. Yes. Uh, you talk about uh, the full job education, but the less emphasis on the Yes. Yes. Let's also certificates. I think I agree with you. So now, Mori has to do it. Certification body that will require certificate before you are employed. How do we tackle that? Yeah, I think uh, 
It's true. I mean, and that's that's an argument that gets raised, gets raised a lot, that there will be a requirement from national bodies that people have credentials or certificates. Some of that's not going to go away because, you know, a, a lot of a lot of types of work do need to be regulated. Airline pilots, for example, need to be regulated. That's a minority, though, a very small minority of all the positions available. I think for the most part, um, people learning for themselves won't need to worry about their credentials, right? If they're learning just to get something done, it's not the credential that they're after, it's getting something done. So that's one answer. The second part of the answer is, um, I think, and this has been a very slow development, but it's happening, we will move more and more toward what's called prior learning assessment or prior learning assessment and review. So that a person's proven experience in, uh, in an occupation or in a profession as measured by external evaluators, probably using technology, will be recognized as equivalent to um, formal education for a certification. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, for those cases where testing is needed, testing and learning, and this is one of the things I said in 1998, testing and learning will ultimately be separated. The people who offer the learning won't be the same people who evaluate the learning. And when that happens, we'll wonder why we never did this before, because it's kind of a conflict of interest for the person offering the learning to be testing the learning. So really they should be separated. separated. And in many professions we're seeing this already, and I think where these certificates are an issue, that is more and more likely to become the solution. Okay, thank Good you. Good question. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Right, I'm going to hand over now to Mark West. Oh, I'm going to move. I'm going to make me move. Shouldn't make me move. Thanks a lot, Michelle. Um, again, as Michelle mentioned, I'm Mark West. Um, I'm coming from UNESCO's headquarters in Paris, and I'm here today to talk about a very exciting initiative that UNESCO has launched called the Futures of Education. For those of you who may not be familiar with UNESCO, uh, this is the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. We are the lead organization in the United Nations family on education issues. Um, this is a flagship initiative for UNESCO. It was just launched last September at the United Nations General Assembly in New York. So my purpose here today is to talk about this initiative we're doing and to explain that for the next year, UNESCO is going to be inviting you and your networks to contribute to this process. We don't claim to have all the answers, but we do have a clear vision of what we want to accomplish and reimagining, revisioning education is at the heart of this two-year initiative UNESCO will launch. Again, the genesis of this comes from uh, the Secretary General of the UN has called on UNESCO to lead when it comes to thinking about the future of education. What education is today, we all know, but what education might become going forward. It also springs from these global tensions that we're seeing. I think there is increasing recognition that some of our education models are simply uh, not working or perhaps taking us in directions that are not desirable. Um, I'm speaking specifically about rising inequality, which is a problem here in Africa and across the world. The planet at its limits, sustainability is central to all of the United Nations work and certainly UNESCO's work. And so how do we come to new patterns of development, new ways of being that allow us to live in harmony with the earth? And then, of course, this pace of technological change that we know that education is vastly different today than it certainly was 20 years ago and the possibilities for education are very different as Stephen was speaking about. This is the aim of our initiative. This is the sort of overriding purpose. But again, I want to emphasize this process of sort of visioning. 
to reimagine what education is, what education might be. We've picked the time horizon of 2050, and I know that many people may sort of roll their eyes there, think, you know, this is science fiction. 20, it's hard to know what's happening in 10 years. We talk about a 2030 agenda for education, SDG goals. So 2050 is, you know, in the very distant future. This was an intentional choice from UNESCO. The reason is we want to sort of pull people out of their presenteeism and help them to imagine an education that may be very different than the one today, a world that may be very different than today. And so that choice of putting a sort of very distant time horizon is intentional. How will this initiative work? The initiative is going to be led by an international commission. The commission is being led by the president of Ethiopia, and this is a change that UNESCO in the past has had some of these visioning exercises. We have done this about every 25 years or so. In the past, these exercises have been led by European men, and this time <coughs> being led by somebody in the south in Africa. So she will chair this commission, and the commission is made up of sort of eminent personalities uh, from various walks of life, from the arts, from businesses, from academia, um, and other areas that will ultimately lead and steer uh, the, the work that UNESCO does. We get a lot of questions about how does this relate to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development? As we know, in 2015, the member states of the world came together, the countries of the world came together and agreed on sort of 17 goals for development. Um, and they have specific targets under all these goals. Of course, UNESCO is leading the work on the education goal, SDG 4, and there are a number of sort of specific targets. This work remains critical and important, without question. But this agenda does put sort of doesn't really reimagine education. It talks about the importance of primary school, secondary school. It talks about the importance of literacy, which are all fundamental to our work. And they will carry us, and we hope we will achieve these objectives by 2030. But our work is, again, looking 20 years beyond this. What education might still become? What do we want to accomplish from this grand enterprise of education, bringing all of these teachers and students? Think of the enormous organization involved in education, what are the whys around this, this, this purpose, this enterprise? I mentioned that education, this follows a sort of trajectory, or has a lineage, so to speak. In 1972, we had our Learning to Be report, uh, and then in 1996, the Delores report. Um, some of you uh, probably versed in some of the findings from these, these reports. These were sort of seminal works that help to establish directories and kind of understandings, even norms for education. And this is a continuation of this work. Obviously, 1996, the world was a very different place than it is today. 1996 was sort of the triumph of neoliberalism, um, techno the technology, a lot of enthusiasm about the promise of technology. Today, I think there are a lot more concerns and doubts about directions we're going with, it, with technology and education and in other fields. So again, this is meant to follow uh, this trajectory. This work will also draw on UNESCO's many knowledge products. UNESCO is publishing reports, of course, on, on you know a yearly basis or much more than that. But this is an important report where we sort of laid foundations for the work that we'll do with the futures of education. And we this phrase is important about education being a global common good. Many countries will define education perhaps an individual good, a, a national good, but what can be a global common good with regards to education? Um, we have tentatively titled Mark, this... Yeah. Can you go back one? Sure. Okay, take it back. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Is yes. Okay. Sorry. We've tentatively titled this report Learning to Become. Um, and this is intended to establish a continuity with the reports I mentioned, the Learning to Be, the, the, uh, the four reports in 1972. Um, and this emphasizes this concept of 
becoming, of constant transformation, of evolution, and that there is not a sort of predestined path for people. It also, of course, puts lifelong learning, I think, at the, the center of this, that, that we are always becoming something new. Humanity and societies can become something different. So this concept is important and sort of gives us a little bit of a trajectory for this uh, initiative. We also use futures in the plural. This is not to be sort of annoying or anything. It's meant to signal that there will be multiple futures. <coughs> I can say that I've been with UNESCO for the past over eight years now, and I can say that you know the directions that people want to go vary from community to community, country to country. So there is not sort of one universal fixed future we need to be working towards. There may be multiple futures that will probably have some shared connections, but it's meant to signal that the futures for people in one area are not necessarily the same futures for people in others. There are fears, the challenges, the desirable, um, the wanted can be very different depending on where you stand. Over the next year, again I mentioned we were going to be inviting all of your ideas and looking for input and consultation. We're going to be in a listening period. <coughs> but we will establish some points for departure and these are listed here. But we do want to think about the future of knowledge, certainly the future of sustainability, the future of public education as we see sort of shifts and challenges with you know privatization of education or individuals kind of steering their own education as we heard of some of what Stephen was saying. So these will be sort of threads that will be discussed uh, and debated and where we're looking for your ideas and consultation. Again, we want this to be, it's, it's UNESCO, this is a global initiative and we look to you to provide ideas and advice. And I'll speak a bit more about these are some of the different partnership networks that we're um, activating uh, to do this. It's not just a sort of government-led initiative. We want civil society, teacher groups, young people to be contributing to this. Um, this is a quite complex looking <laughs> timeline, but it's a uh, to just unpack this, this is just showing that, that we are eventually planning to release a report in November of 2021 that will capture sort of the main findings from this uh, initiative. And that will be at UNESCO's general conference in 2021. So that's, we're really looking at a two year long uh, process to do this. But this being central, these consultation uh, processes. And then I wanted to get a little more into how people can contribute to this process, and there are many different ways. Let me spend a minute, a minute to talk about those different ways. One is all of you are in networks and work with different stakeholder groups. Some of you are working with teachers. Some of you may be working with the business community. Some of you are probably working with uh, learners. Some of you are from civil society organizations. We would like to invite you to organize in cooperation with UNESCO, a consultation where you bring these people together and you talk about the futures of education and what sort of futures they're imagining and envisioning. And then to briefly send us some input that will be helpful for our processes. So um, UNESCO is going to be putting a number of tools online to help you lead these consultations if you want. Hi. Um, Thank you. You got a red card, by the way. That's not a yellow card, a red card. And I can go through some of these other ways, but these will all be explained on our on our website. But we're inviting everything from artwork to essays um, to just completing a sort of 60-second survey. So there's a number of ways to engage uh, with this initiative. And I'll leave us, with this is the website that will be constantly changing for uh, the new initiative. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so our first speaker, Matthias Matthias, who will introduce himself very briefly and talk about what HP is doing um, towards the future of education. And the red card doesn't work behind in front of that red background. Yeah. Oh, 
visible. That's brilliant. We can see it. So we can keep <laughs> going. You know what, Marcus? I give to you. So you don't have to stop. <laughs> you don't have to stop on the yellow yeah. curve then. I know, right? Yeah. Well, since Stephen thinks that I'm here to sell you guys something, I'm going to actually not, not, not do none of that. Is that okay? Well, none of that. Cause, cause you, you, you know, it'll remind me of a very good kind of a intellectual personality, right? Yes, the guy that for him, everything was relative. Uh. <laughs> now, to the... I'm oh, Awesome. So, so uh, uh, I'm just trying to just grab from what both Stephen and Mark said, right? It's a tremendous challenge in front of every single one of you. Right? How do we imagine education in 2050, Mark? That's a good, I'll, I'll do that by the time. So that would be amazing. Uh, the, the question that I have to do uh, in, in trying to kind of uh, challenge you guys is that we don't have to 2050 to make the changes. Actually, we cannot wait till tomorrow. So uh, I'll try to take a challenge and invite you to join us on it. Is that we need to get this done now, right? Does anybody disagree with this assessment? Do you disagree? We don't need to do anything now? We need to start thinking about it. Oh, we start thinking about it. Okay. You've got to think about what you're going to do first. I, I totally agree. But we need to start now. Yeah. Right? I, I've been doing this for the past, at least on education. I'm with the HP for 32. So I've been doing quite a few versions of this. But we talk a lot. If we keep talking and don't do anything, that's it. Nothing happens, right? Uh, just to say, if you can imagine the future, uh, just go and build it. Well, let's build it. You guys ready to build it? And let's start the discussion. I have a slide on there. Hold on. Okay, let's see this. So, uh, just for news, uh, just to put some numbers on both what Mark and Steven said, 65% uh, of the kids today are going to be uh, joining a marketplace where their jobs do not exist. Let's put a number on it. Just 65% of them. Right? Today in Spain, half percent of the kids that graduate from the university do not have a job. Not because they're bad, because the skill set they have all the time developing is useless. I can keep going with more numbers if you want to. Uh, are you recording this? Oh, the Spanish oh, yeah. of this. Yeah, I'm sorry, I apologize. Perdón. Uh, well, why do we have to do this? Because the jobs are changing. The jobs today are different than they were when I started age three. I started in Portuguese in Brazil, and I said, you guys probably never heard about it, it's called Porto Alegre. Really far, close to Argentina and Uruguay. I have broken bones because I used to play soccer as well. So, uh, no, I was not prepared to be here today. At all. That's not what my education system did to me. But we have to set the mind to, well, let's see what kind of a skill set's going to be required to get ready. I'll just be with everybody here, and the kids that we have under our responsibility today, for jobs that we, we don't know what they're going to be. So it's quite a challenge. And for us at HP, if you want to really define what's going to be the jobs of the future, what kind of the skill set that needs to be done, to be developed, and needs to be in place, we need to start now. Because again, uh, heads up, uh, who has been in school? Have you been in high school before? Okay, that's not a tricky question. <laughs> I hope I see all heads up. No. Have you all been to school? Okay, good. So, uh, willingly or not, that's when you started your preparation to be here today. For good or for bad. Uh, with good or bad experiences behind that. And what we're trying to do is, because now we live in a global society, again, there's a Brazilian actually speaking with you in English, which is not common, at least in my country, my family, I'm actually the only one, right? Uh, and how, how do you prepare for that? Which is preparing for the unknown. And for us at HP, it's about basically three things. First, it's about the people that we touch all the time. Everything happens because that person has the power, has the skill set to go and do whatever they think. It's going to be relevant, it's going to be meaningful, it's going to be important. Secondly, what do we have to do not to bring technology, not to sell PCs and laptops and printers? I don't care about that. What kind of experiences needs to be in place to help them develop the skill set that they think is going to be important for the next step and the next step? And the next step. The beauty of technology, though, is that because we have some quite interesting tools, we can build equality and equity and make that available everywhere and every time. Yeah, you can be just a click away to be on experiences, sharing the same experience that an MIT student is doing today. It's a click away from it. Oh, how do we do that? So, it starts now. 
not tomorrow, not yesterday. It starts with you and it starts right now. How do we do this? Take a picture of this one. It's a nice framework. Focus on basically three things. First, plan to change. Because <laughs> news, yeah, tomorrow will be different. A month from now, you might not even recognize it. Ten years from now, oh my goodness sake. So if you do any type of investments, then you're not planning to change. On the fly, you're already obsolete. Secondly, uh, who is a teacher in here or educator? Okay. So uh, I'm going to commit to you that I'm going to be talking to every single government leadership that if they do not start a transformation from teachers, you, the process will fail. Why? Because you guys are the ones that own the responsibility. You're with the kids with all the time. You have to mitigate all the resources or lack of it to make the best of their experiences. So yeah, you guys are step one. Not three, not 50, not 150. Oh no, I actually forgot to train them to how to use a computer correctly in the classroom. That's why I'm trashing them now. And third, reinvent everything around you. And I mean everything around you. You ready for this? Because I have six minutes left. And I'm gonna get a red card. So, well I know, I know, Marcus is gonna beat me. So, so I'm gonna use some examples that we already have done in Africa. Okay, is that okay? So this is actually South Africa in the uh, district in Newcastle. It's hot and humid. And Mark was with me in Indonesia. It's not as bad as there, Mark. So, so my point is that forget about the technology that's being discussed, what platform, what, what computer needs to be. That's not important. First thing to your point, sir, on the back, try to identify what's really important for you. What meaningful outcomes are. Not just academically but what kind of impact social and economic that can have once we start thinking a little bit different than that. This is not part of the typical education, it's human capital development. We are trying to build up a new skill set, prepare for the future. There's a seat right here, so if you want to. So let's talk about outcomes. And one thing that I tell you, we are not the good ones, is that we, we are not educators. We are a technology company. So we have to do a lot of research from how to make students successful, how can we make, oh, that's supposed to be teachers, not teachers. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's not bad. It's not good to that. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I like that. That was a good mistake at 3, 4, 5 a.m., so I'm sorry about that. Uh, transform the classrooms. How can new technologies bring a completely different meaning to what education can look like? I'll show you a video and let's see if you like it. Uh, third, we have to transform the schools as well, from management to security. Everything needs to be in place. If you miss one of these, I don't know, the process will probably fail. And of course, understand where you want to go. What is going to be your learning, social, and economic outcomes that are really trying to drive investments to get that return on? Right? Please, if you put up an initiative, don't do a one-to-one -one that now there's 20 kids for one computer, and the goal is going to be to have every single kid with a computer on. You will fail if you do that. And if you talk to me, I will not let you do it. So it doesn't matter if you are on K-12, on primary and secondary, or if you are on tertiary education. The stakeholders are the same. The way you have to position, it's exactly the same. So focus on reinventing everything. And I mean everything. Oh, it was too fast? Okay, well, I was criticizing Mark. It was going too fast on the slides. Three, two, one, go. Okay. So to help you with that first step, and I have actually the privilege to work with Mark and one that we did it actually right here, Mark. I put a picture because I knew you were there. So uh, we were there in Indonesia trying to understand from the city of Bogor, what are the key things that the government needs to do to really make a difference on Indonesia, right? So one of the things that we came with this process in which we interview, uh, we embed ourselves into the education system. We talk to, to the students, teachers, their parents, the employers on it, the local leadership, the uh, uh, state leadership, the country leadership, to understand what's really important. And one of the cool things that came out of this, this, this report that we did for, for Indonesia is that we don't tell them buy technology. No, we told them keep the kids in school after grade five. Because dropout rates over there was about 50% on grade five. So the country's poor. Well, yeah, you don't have the right skill set to keep going. So we proposed to them, oh, let's make an investment, everybody together in grade six. We told the parents, if you keep a kid in school, they can probably make from eight to 10% more. Every year they stay on education. Do the simple math, that kid is worth three. 
I think the parents got the idea, and we're going with that initiative as we speak. So it goes way beyond, oh, let's bring computer stories. We don't care. So we did this in Peru, so we'll talk about Indonesia. The second thing is the reinvent learning. And I mean, reinvent learning is that teachers, as we know, that the ones that come to class, it speaks for 45 minutes, in this case, uh, three. Uh, and, uh, and have to pass an information, and you will hope they will remember, which is scientifically proven that does not work, needs to change. What needs to change? What they're teaching and how they teach, it's different. He's not over there to tell that the capital of uh, Egypt is... Cairo. That was not a tricky question. <laughs> and if I ask at the capital of Australia, we have somebody from Perth. What's the capital of Australia? I'll help you, it's not Sydney. <laughs> you thought Sydney, it's not. Cabra. Okay, there is a kid that actually had an argument with me in Indonesia about that. So we have to change, we have to empower and enable you guys to be the agents of transformation. Uh, you probably see in other sessions that there's the change management process to it. Yeah, the only one that's not involved is the teacher inside the classroom. Uh, no, don't do that again. So it doesn't matter the strategy, the academic strategy is trying to implement. Everything on the ground needs to be flexible, needs to be enabled, needs to be happen immediately, not in 10 seconds. Uh, who over here has used technology in the classroom? Hands up. Okay, it's very fast to get every single student on task and log in and ready to go, right? Very fast, about 12 minutes, 15. <laughs> Zero. Oh, they're not using that. Oh, it's always on? Oh my goodness, I need to go there. Because at the MIT, that doesn't happen. Because we measure it. So 12, 15 minutes to log in? Uh, not good, you have 45 to do with them. So yeah. production line, and you'll be failed already. So we need to take into consideration that things will happen in real time. Changes will happen in real time. So everything needs to be ready to change in real time. To my point number one, plan to change. So it's not about the content. We're saying the skill sets that have been developing today obsolete in a month, that it's obsolete in a year. If we're planning about like Mark, let's focus on 2050. The most important skill that we need to teach them is how to learn. You do that, they're ready forever. Which is this one? Good. So, now let's go for the fun part. Now let's change everything around us. This is actually a real classroom. I know, I have 30 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> I'm counting. Nice. I'm going to get yellow cards and red very, very soon. So let's reinvent everything around it. And that, that means let's reinvent everything. So the first thing, don't keep doing industrial revolution. Do you have a clock in your classroom? Who knows why the clock is in there? Who knows? So you can tell the time. <laughs> well, no. The that's reason is that clock for. The, the, the reason is that on this time, when that system was invented, you have to develop a skill on a workforce in which they have to perform a task on a specific period of time. Yeah. You have ten minutes to put the screw on this and that's it. Oh, hence a clock became part of your classrooms. You still have a clock. I was in Belgium last week and the kids were complaining that the clock did not have a battery, so it was not working. <laughs> so it's going, what? No, it's not about that. What we're trying to do is that focus on the people, trying to now reinvent the experience that will be allowing and empowering them to develop the right skill set, which could be anything. Okay, so again, it's not about the device. Call the experience whatever you want, but rethink how that process should look like. I'm not gonna let you imagine too much because we have basically no time left. So let me show you a few ideas. Are you okay with it? Do you have three minutes? I'm asking for an extension, I know. Okay, so, simple skill set development. We talked about it, right? Reading and writing. Everybody went through it, right? Do you remember that? Let's apply technology, what do you think? Oh well, yeah, now let's do technology. It's amazing, it's touch. It's amazing, I can use a pen. In my opinion, you're doing the same with blink. Einstein used to say that if you keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect different results, you are insane. So let's not be insane. Don't do this. It's the wrong approach. Oh, so what 
that experience could look like. Take a look at this. F, so we're going to put that under the camera. And there's Frankie Flower. Bring it close to the camera and see him close up. Now I'm going to build a sentence using some of our pre-K and kindergarten sight word cards. Duck, frog, can, and swim. Or swim. If you put a wrong verb in the front, we say no, it cannot fly. And pick that up. Show them sideways. There it goes. Now you got the idea. Slightly different, right? Yeah, slightly different. Kids are actually not having fun doing that. I'll show you a video that will show actually if that happened. So let's take a traditional classroom. This is actually Madrid. And uh, let's apply a different idea to it. Let's say that for now, you want to use design thinking and uh, completely redesign that space. All right, let's say that we want to do different stuff than just listening. Let's say that we want to make them unleash their creativity, think whatever, do whatever, build whatever, test whatever. Oh, but let's go back and redo it again. And imagine it, if single classroom, every single classroom in your school would look like this. What kind of experiences now you guys can build on it? All right? might look like this, which is that same classroom that the kids and teachers you see. I actually took the picture from the same angle. Hopefully that was on the same spot before and after. Right? But it doesn't need to be in Spain. It could be in South Africa. And that will look a little bit different. That's on the same school. Am I any? I don't know what you're pointing to that. So, so it's a shame. It's a shame that you saw this. Yeah. You, you should see this. Yeah. And, and I'll show you the first picture that I took from him. I just look at the bright shiny thing. Here. Yeah, don't. Please don't. That's not what I'm trying to do. Okay, let me change that. Is that better? Bright shiny. No, it's very small. Look, the HP logo is really small. So, so no, it's not about the technology, right? So what we're really trying to do, and this is the results that we're already getting from that school. It's not that now we have the computers. Read this. Yes, kids are going to school. Second, there are more kids actually. Oh, I want to be on that school. Third, the teachers. Oh, gee, this is good. <coughs> oh, I can actually get this done. That's not a bad idea. This is in South Africa. If you look at the map, it's in the middle of nowhere. There's actually no connectivity in this school. And I know my time is off. One video, and I finish. Should we let him have a video? One yes. video? Yes. I knew you'd say that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone likes video. Everyone loves himself. Oh, okay, so look. So to, 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 just to break this down, right? I'm going to make one question. Do you know what IT means? According to Stephen, it, yeah. You know, right? Yeah, well, you're wrong. We, we, we'll make that question to the kids, because you're thinking about this, right? Yeah. Okay. We make the same question to the kids. Oh, listen to this. I have no idea. What's the hydrologic cycle? What's school like in rural Afghanistan? I, I don't know. Um... What does the nebula NGC 6543 look like? Uh, I don't know. How do you scan an object in 3D? That is a question. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's what a trilophon is. This is amazing. No, it can't. That's, oh my gosh, it's like nothing I've ever done or seen before. Well, let's go inside the turtle. Okay, so there's water, there's a mountain. You know, you can read about something, but you can't actually know how it feels until you experience it. This is the turtle I invented. You can build anything what's in your imagination. The UN video, it's like a new level of learning, and it really helps to put yourself in their shoes. And you're there with them, experiencing what they're doing and feeling their emotions. It looks like a big dragon. And actually, I never thought of a dragon with horns. It gave me a new perspective of how things I don't know look. This is like next level cool. Instead of just seeing one perspective, there are a bunch. I didn't even know this existed. So and according to Chris Dean from Harvard, that's worth eating at two points. So, we are here to make that it, this, because that's what the kids want. That's what they need. And uh, together with you, we're going to bring the next level of cool for money.
on every single classroom, on every single interaction, doesn't matter if you're there or not. Thank you. And you should be Thanks very much, Right, it's time. Thank you. We've had three very different visions. I mean, Stephen, mm -hmm. and, I, and I, I do think there are links there. Um, <clears throat> Stephen talked about people um, learning what they need to, to learn in order to do what they want to do and, and taking that agency for themselves in, in their learning. I think what we have are um, this learning to become idea, which is the same notion. I want, what do I want to become? You know, I, where I live will, will help determine what I'm going to become. But it will also, knowing about the world will give me aspirations to become something more than I already am. So it could help improve livelihoods. And then we had Matthias talking about um, reinventing the classroom. Well, if we are going to move to this idea of learning to become, learning what we need when we need it, this just in time, just for me, and just enough learning then we do need to reinvent classrooms. But we have one huge challenge, and it's a challenge, I've been mean, having these discussions about education needs to change for, I have grey hair, and it's, it's not age, of course. It's, it's frustration that things don't change fast enough. And why don't they change fast enough? It's because of education is such a political animal. And decisions made about education are made by people two generations above those children in schools today. Right. So we need to really think about listening to the youth, and you're, I'm so glad that you've got those people involved in your project. We've got to listen to the youth. But how on earth do we get governments to listen to the conversations that we're going to have in this room today? Because until they do, I, I really am worried that nothing is going to seriously change. So. Yeah. Um, should we open the floor? So, Michelle, can I make an observation on that? Because the political side is extremely important, right? So don't, yeah. don't take me wrong. Uh, just as an example, the, the project we started in South Africa, the government changed in between, right? So uh, kind of a one kind of a rule of, you guys can that. So uh, one rule of the thumb that we're trying to do every single time is that this is always political. We have to be smart, smart enough to change from the political investment to be a policy investment. Because if it becomes policy, then it becomes a long term. And the other governments that are coming in, trust me, uh, 2050, did you read the calculations of how many governments are going to be on that? Like 30, right? 25. With different leadership coming into it. If we work together to build up sustainable policies <coughs> that can actually withstand the time and the recycling of politicians, it, it will make sense. Then I actually think that the, the change uh, is, is going to get out of the governments and the universities and the schools' hands very, very quickly. Because if you think about it, with gatekeepers of knowledge being yeah. destroyed yeah. and access to content being available, there's going to be coming a time where you can take a chip and download content into your brain. So it's the, I think we, when we're thinking of reinventing education, we have to think about also reinventing what the role of the people who are learning providers or solution providers or teachers is going to be. Because it's not going to be about giving knowledge. It's going to be about giving experience and helping them. But you have to remember the content is of knowledge. But that's yeah. If it's it's the content, it's not enough. It's what you do with the content, how you make sense of it, right. how you validate it, how you justify it. But if you think about it, in schools, what are we doing? In universities, what are we doing? We're downloading yeah. content. We are. So Absolutely. we call it knowledge. Yeah. 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 I, I, guess, I think I that reason. point is exactly right. And uh, you know, the idea of reinventing school, why are we even thinking of reinvent in school when most education takes place outside of school and when the school is the most expensive part of the whole system. You know? yeah. uh, why are we thinking about like HoloLens and VR which is very expensive and does nothing but deliver content rather than people giving people actual experiences doing things and creating things. But I mean that's going to be part of the solution as well because yeah. we can't forget the fact that you know Technology is not going to be, education is not in a silo. Technology is going to change in ways yeah. we can't even imagine. But when it hit me when my 10 year old wanted to learn about communism and learned it all on his own yeah. in school. Yeah. And meanwhile, he's not interested in anything else that they're teaching in school. And, and yeah, let me tell you, it's failing in school. Right. Your, your question. Well, it's very much uh, connected because you ask in, in a way disruptive questions, and because the future is disruptive uh, as well. And I want to connect it with the initiative that UNESCO 
uh, is doing and how far is there going to be space in the entire, let's say, consultation process for some disruptiveness? Because then some of the questions, if you say that the future of education or future of schools will be by old schools, which is a disruptive question, I think the methodology that uh, UNESCO proposes, foresight and futures thinking, is exactly to address, let's say, unforeseen complexities. But I'm always then a little bit critical and skeptical also if we then see, okay, apart from the consultation, then there will be a high level commission uh, presided by uh, presidents and with all good intentions, but again, the political element will come in there and there will be future predictions that already today we can predict of what kind of solution they will come up with in 2021. So how far can disruptiveness be played as part of such a conversation uh, as well? And how far do we still need, let's say, very traditional methodologies and processes like commissions and so on to actually envision alternative futures while technology, uh, crowdsourced intelligence and all the things are out there to envision any future that everyone would want. So there's a bit also questioning not only of government, of it, but also of I'm working also for a UN agency and asking the same critical questions. Yeah. But is there space enough to ask these questions and how do we address them and how do we not escape them? Because that is happening uh, a lot. And I just uh, I praise that foresight will be used, but will it be used in the proper way? The questions you're raising are important. We we are using foresight, so we're looking at trends, analysis, and other things, what directions we seem to be going. But we also want to open ourselves to new possible futures. So just because something is happening and there's a direction of, say, technology development or developments in AI, it is not a preordained future we're going to. So this is also about imagining. What type of futures do we want? Is it useful? Absolutely. I mean, most of us in this room would assume that primary school education should be compulsory, it should be free, um, it should be a public good. That's a common belief shared by almost all people. That belief started through conversations at UNESCO. So we want to start these conversations to establish these norms. I mean, they, they came from all different places, but, but through these global organizations, we were able to disperse the, these ideas and to help them to become norms of what we think of education today. And we hope that through this visioning exercise, we can help to at least problematize some of the directions we're moving in. And I really want to emphasize, I mean, if you read the UN reports on the fragility of the planet, it is very, very frightening. And I have not heard, I've been attending this conference for several years, I don't hear the word sustainability. I don't hear the word about sort of ecological collapse or these other things that are in many UN scientific reports. And what does education look like to ensure that these development patterns don't take us off, off a cliff? I think so that's, it, it, is, it is about foresight, we're not ignoring that, but it's also about to prompting imagination. Part of this, it's not just a product. Part of it is the process itself of helping people to kind of break out of what's, what's here and now, our presenteeism, and think what could be or should be desirable futures. See, I think what we're... Let's What we're... Uh, be, you said something very contentious, and you said the idea of open education came from, or, you know, a free public education came from UNESCO. And that's not true. Uh, I think it came from people originally, certainly in my country, in many other countries, people had this idea before UNESCO even existed. And the idea filtered up and eventually reached UNESCO and eventually will even reach corporations. Perhaps one day. Um, similarly with environmentalism, it has been decades since people have been talking about the need to address things like pollution, climate change, and the rest. And it's only in 2019, or, or you know, a few years previous, that it reaches UNESCO, it reaches government, maybe one day will reach corporations who will change their bottom line from earning money to doing social good. <laughs> These ideas come from the people. I, I, totally, I, I totally agree with that, but it is still useful to establish global norms, and those global norms are established through, often, at the time being, through it, global it, institutions. Who is it useful to? Can I have yes. 
think my question is going to Stephen and to Michelle. So talking about the skills... Michelle? Uh, I'm sorry, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Matthias, talking about the skills needed for employability or for job mm. in the future, you mentioned this artificial intelligence, how we will um, assess um, the outcome of productivity. How do you reflect that uh, in, in, let's say, in less developing countries in an international context? Because like, we know IT based also on data generated, and it could be years also. Will that not create more, um, more bias between the, uh, developed countries and less developed countries? How far, how do you contextualize, let's say, this, uh, this skills analysis based on IE? Uh, in the, in the globalized world. So that is one question to Steve. Mm -hmm. And the other now to Matthias is on the on the hardware. So for me, when we are talking about e-learning over the last 20 years, how we consume, uh, uh, how we consume content with learning management is not really what we, uh, what we have to think on, on, on the futures of e-learning. So there were a lot of hope in virtual and augmented reality, but it's always at least two or three years that uh, with Oculus Rift and some Appear, but even now we just we don't see all these changes. So in terms of hardware, I think to to have the, the classroom as you have imagined to come, I think hardware plays also a very important role. And 2050, as I say, I'm not so optimistic on all this. Even what you have shown with the card, I think there are a lot more. more. So if you can give us maybe, uh, let's say, uh, how far the hardware are ready. So to support this immersive learning, and maybe if there are also new hardware or new possibility coming, what you have in your labs at the MIT there, how the future will look like in the realistic perspective. Because as I say, in 2050, I'm not sure that the whole immersive classroom that you have presented will, uh, will happen. So your feedback on the development of hardware to assist this immersive uh, content. Okay, so you want to start then? So, and, and, uh, and I confess, I didn't get the full gist of your question, so please forgive me. Uh, but my understanding is that the concern is with the skills training, ensuring that it does not increase the inequality between nations and that it actually closes the gap between nations. And, and that is something to be careful of because, uh, I mean, one of the things that does characterize, you know, a, a country like Canada, say, is that we have a very skilled workforce um, with a lot of you know a lot of content knowledge, as they would say, right? Um, you know, people actually have been trained for jobs that exist. We have expertise in artificial intelligence, oil and gas, whatever, right? You name it. Not that I'm proud of having expertise in oil and gas, but we we'll that aside. Um, sorry, camera. Um, but. And now I talk about, you know, uh, enhancing the skills of, of individuals, and I'm not talking about these skills, and it sounds like, okay, well, I'm not, I'm not proposing anything that would close that gap. But uh, one of the things that we've been able to do in Canada is by promoting a high level of literacy, a high level of mathematical aptitude, you know, these, these not, not basic skills, but, but you know, critical, I don't even want to say critical thinking because that's too narrow, but, um, you know, the, 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 as, as he said before, who's whispering now, um, the ability to learn is what's made this possible for us, right? Uh, if you look at Canada, a lot of these skills in artificial intelligence, etc., were self-taught by the people who are doing it because there were no courses in universities. A lot, you know, telecommunications where we're expert. A lot of these technologies were self-taught. We, we developed them ourselves. So it's this capacity, I think, uh, that narrows the gap, right? Rather than trying to catch up by doing, learning what people have already learned and doing what they've already done, actually developing the capacity to come up with the new technologies and the new possibilities uh, yourselves. I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not an expert in closing the gap like that, but, but it just seems to me that, you know, it's like 
you remember there was Silicon Valley and then and then they made all kinds of money from Silicon Valley and they became rich and and then everybody wanted to have the same opportunity so everybody else became they wanted to build their own Silicon Valley but you can't catch up to Silicon Valley by being another Silicon Valley you, you can't you know do the same thing by doing what they did Okay. You know, what, what I was trying to say, so I take a concrete example. For black migrants in Europe, you have to work twice to have the same recognition as all your colleagues in here. And artificial mm. intelligence, if they have to assess it, so how do you make sure that this bias is not integrated in the oh, life Oh, okay. So, and how people working in Africa yeah, I totally have to be it. happy. So if you have to analyze the habit to work in the futures, how yeah. artificial intelligence take into consideration all these nitty-gritties, since the, the, the data that they use to assess the, the, the performance and so on, yeah. appears already from the beginning. So how do you deal with this? Uh, so to make it more the roots that you understand. Yeah. Okay, first of all, you're absolutely right. I missed your question, and for that I apologize profusely. Um, and I feel really stupid. But, okay. Um, yeah, first of all, I acknowledge the problem. It is a problem. Uh, we've seen our artificial intelligence systems be trained very badly to do very inappropriate things. Um, the, the simple answer is make sure you get the data set right because artificial in intelligence systems are trained on data and it's like any inductive inference, really. Uh, the data going in has to be representative of the entire society. Uh, there has to be a sufficient quantity of it. It has to be sufficiently diverse. They've been training it with data from like a single classroom in a school in Kansas. You're not going to get good data doing that. Um, but I think more than that as well, we need to look at the type of data that's being used. Um, a lot of the a lot of the data that goes in is almost hypothetical. Um, like for example, um, language learning AI systems using Twitter as input, which is craziness, right? Um, so we need to broaden the kind of input that goes into artificial intelligence. Finally, the last thing is. There needs to be a mechanism for what they call explainability for artificial intelligence. So when, uh, say, you have an AI system that hires a person for a job, right, and not another person, there needs to be a way to be able to explain why did the AI do this instead of that? And it's hard because there are no rules built in. But there needs to be a system in order to do that so that we can catch those kind of things and correct them after the fact. That's the best answer I can give to that. I hope that was a better answer than my first one, which was so really awesome. So let me see if we can complement what Stephen. I'm going to touch this question, then I'll address the second point, is that uh, the role of technology in going forward, right? Uh, I'm, again, I'm a resident uh, working in the United States. So I kind of, uh, some of them will say the same, but not there, right? But I understand exactly what, what you're going for that. So just kind of relate a little bit of the uh, interesting processes already to, into this one. But, but let me kind of be a little positive spin to this one. Right? Uh, you can look short term and long term, and I'll make a big differentiation on that. Uh, if you're trying to make investments right now, in which you're trying to build up, as the your Minister of Education was saying, uh, build employability criteria into them, there's one exercise that needs to be done that it's very seldom happened, right? which is uh, connect to the employers on the region and ask them what kind of a skill sets are required to get them employed in Ivory Coast, in France, in Germany, anywhere. If you map those skill sets and establish partnerships with the employers, now you have a purpose to build curriculum development and skill set development that is targeting a specific industry. Same country as Spain because I mentioned them before, right? One university saw that as an opportunity, so they built up a university in order to do animation, so all the uh, uh, computer graphics into that, right? Uh, and uh, the, the beauty of this is that they work with the, the competition for DreamWorks, okay, 
and that the kids that go there already have reported because again they are mapping the requirements of a specific industry and developing the skill sets that for them the colleges that grow most in the United States today are community colleges and the, the small ones that are building those associate degrees that are targeting a specific employer that, by the way, I want to hire 30 people. They need to do this. Train them for me. And, and it's right there. So there's a short-term answer, which is that. The long-term, which is behavior and uh, all the other connotations that they brought up. So I think we are still a long way to get to kind of a, it's everything equal, everything is on the same ground. Uh, if I think it will ever happen, I, well, I don't. So I think it's kind of a new topic to think that, that will be. But the only thing that can be done to bridge that gap it's to make sure that the skill set that you have is going to be as competitive as anybody else on the other point. Because if any corporation or anybody is trying to get to the next level, they will need the best talent. And I'll tell you, it doesn't matter who that person is. If that's the person that have the right skill set for that task, well, the possibilities of them going to the next level is higher than the one that will not have. The challenge is that that's globalized. Right? So you're competing with other educational systems that have all the infrastructure in the world. I was on the most incredible, uh, yesterday, I was in Belgium, and I visited a private school. The kids pay 60,000 euros a year to go to that school. You can imagine the infrastructure behind it, right? So you're competing with them. So how do we now put our plans together to bridge that gap? You can't. Again. You can't. Yeah, uh, I'm a little bit more optimistic. Uh, yeah, you have to address the, the, the fact that someone I, can spend that kind of money on I, I, I understand, right? I understand. But we, we, if we provide at least the opportunity and start building the infrastructures and the processes to provide the uh, opportunity to have an education that's not going to be playing on a turf field like they have in there, right? But, but to have that type of education, that type of skill set development that it's at, at par, with that, we might help to bridge that gap. Yeah. It will take a long time, yes. I think it will ever happen, uh, I don't know. And the reason why people spend $60,000 on an education is not for the learning, not for the content, but for the connections that they make in that, that school. Smart. They build a power network, and you can't compete against that just by building. Yeah, so sorry that I said because that was not the question for me, so sorry that I, I had that. <laughs> let, let me go finish with the technology, right? Yeah. So uh, where the technology is going, we, we, we still don't know. What I do know is what's going to be the next three or four generations that you guys have not seen yet, mm -hmm. right? But you can use, uh, as Mark was saying, the mega trends. So where is all of this going, right? The globalization of the factories, the mega cities coming in together, right? And one of the things that we are thinking that's going to happen on, on, on the future is that everything that we know as manufacturing is changing, right? So there is a set of requires of, of skill set that's going to be required for the newer industries. They're all focused on STEM. So if you ask me, especially being very pragmatic on the technology side, uh, STEM careers will probably have a bigger longevity than because you can do everything to everybody. And uh, what's the answer next? It will keep changing, it will keep evolving. And uh, again, the next step of the technology is what we learned from you that we bring back to our labs to understand what kind of a new tools is going to be required to perform the next steps coming in. And I'm not kidding when I bring about manufacturing, right? So this is a 3D printed model that could be a part of the plane. Or, by the way, 15% of our new 3D printers, you can take a look at this if you want. Scott, okay. So I just, just I'll, I'll, I'll come to your question next. Um, just, just a point and then your few next. Um, you know, this, this business about competing, isn't it about finding new niches and specializing in those, finding what is it that's unique to your country and your, your situation that you can actually then, so it's about specialization across the, the world, rather than everyone, and it's another thing about sustainability, because if we have specialization, then not everyone is replicating what everybody else is doing, but we're focusing and concentrating resources. It's just a thought that, um, the discussion that we had yesterday, um, okay, your question first, Daniel. Yeah, I thought we would ask a couple of questions, and I hope then try and be quite fast. But one observation, Matthias, as I think yes. through your presentation and all your responses, you don't use uh, anything related to figures or cost. You don't say that we're going to build low-cost equipment for <laughs> uh, promoting or enhancing the experience to learn. Um, is that the purpose? Or are you yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I told as much. I 
Just a, it's just a remark. It's just a remark. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I can tell you why. No, no, it's fine. I probably understand why. Uh, <laughs> you probably don't. Okay, tell me why. <laughs> that, that's why I'm taking the challenge. Okay. You so, so tell be, because uh, uh, the, uh, how much you pay your acquisition costs, it's one of the components of your entire investment lifecycle. Right? When you make a decision based on, can I afford this right now, might be the wrong approach when your objective is not, okay, let me buy cheap now. So I talk not about the, uh, the cheapest device. Affordability is extremely important, trust me. Extremely important, but the return you get on that investment is even more important. Right? So for us to understand what you're trying to accomplish first, and what's going to be the right tool for the job, it's probably going to be the right answer. Probably not the cheapest. It can be very affordable at the end, but it's probably not going to be the cheapest one because that's not sustainable. Because if you buy something that's really cheap that doesn't work, it doesn't help. Yeah. Okay. We but it needs to be affordable. Yeah, yeah, we can argue a lot about it. In yeah. the context of South Africa and through your presentation as well, there's a lot of comment that can come through it. So the danger with that is that, uh, well, the reality is that uh, you can actually provide uh, the market, especially in the African market. Now, I'm talking from an African perspective. Yeah. Because uh, we're talking about low income. A lot of countries are very poor. Correct. Um, we can provide, or your company can provide them with uh, high-end equipment at a cost that you guys will still be really making profit. That is a reality, and mm -hmm. the mandatory study is done regarding that. But uh, because effectively we live in capitalist type of society, we can't really dictate how you know, the exchange of demand and the market uh, works. But that is a good discussion. Uh, my question was, uh, one of my questions is to Mark, uh, regarding uh, the blueprint of what the initiative that UNESCO is trying to uh, undertake. Is that uh, aim at creating a blueprint at the end where they will make recommendations to government? Um, and if we talk a little bit more specifically about Africa, uh, will be to make to them recommendations that you can utilize this blueprint as you've done before with the organization. And then from there, perhaps it can work for you. Or are you trying to basically create something that you will impose on the other two different sorts of agencies that they must use that in going forward in order to achieve your goals. And my second question to you is why are you considering, or I know you're going to be open that to inviting people to bring in ideas, but why not, or have you guys considered looking at the best model of education at the moment, especially with one way people or pay a lot of money to attend, which the reality is they don't really need to pay all that money. But the outcome of a continuous educational system, and especially the school that you mentioned in Newcastle, that's the high-end type of school, a uh, well-off school. Uh, but uh, the outcome that comes out of those schools and the way they run, actually, they produce better uh, workforce uh, out of them compared to, if I take the case of South Africa, where we have a lot of uh, uh, a township type of school or public school that they or uh, where effectively we have the most of our issues. Why not take a model like those ones? Like we have St. Andrew in uh, South Africa, which is a private school, very well run. They use a completely different model uh, than the one that the government school did in California. The model works. It creates kids that are really, really small and usually end up becoming the leaders in the country. Why not take a model like that? And and adjust it um, and uh, that will suit different areas, specifically talking from African okay, well, I've got three more questions, so let's try and keep the questions brief and responses brief yeah. so that everyone gets an opportunity okay. to answer and ask questions. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Michelle. Thanks for the question. I'll be brief. To your point about a blueprint, I. I don't want to. S we've been very vague about what the what the product will look like because we want to listen first and understand that process, and then we will plan what the product might look like. I doubt it will be a blueprint. This is again we're taking 2050 as a time horizon. I doubt this will be sort of architectural plans of how to build your education system, but more sort of aims that we might aspire to. I just wanted to point out that we're all having this conversation and. There's a narrative running through many of our comments, which is that education is about skills development to compete in a competitive world. This has not always been the vision of what education is. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. We, we, you go back in time, education was about establishing you know, religious norms for societies. 
It's been about education for democratic participation in societies. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is what this initiative is meant to do. It's meant to question some of these assumptions that are running through our questions about education, our hows and whys of education, to sort of step back and see is, is, is that the way this should be going. And this conversation about competition is, you know, our nation, our school, our community, this group of students will get the right skills so they can be successful vis-a-vis -vis all the other skills. There's always going to be losers in that, uh, in that scenario. Yeah. So what is education for a common global good? That's a, it's a big question. We don't have answers, but that's what this initiative is it, about. It takes you back to Matthias's picture of that factory. You know, we're still talking about skills, because education is for skills. Yeah. And it's for skills we don't know, so yeah, absolutely. Um, so your question next. And, and there's not just one answer, right? Yeah. 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 No, there isn't. That, that's the challenge. Let's, let, so let's take the three questions and then try and put them together into answers. So, Bill's first. Yeah, my name is Yuga from Ghana, and I'm making a contribution rather than maybe asking a question. I think part of the discussion has been about, the, for example, reinventing the classroom and the hardware costs and technological. Goals. And if the classroom is the primary area in which people get education or knowledge, what are the roles of the other media through which people get knowledge and education? What are we doing with the radio and our television institution, for example? If you tune to North African radio and television stations, you get about 10 hours of music, videos, and not necessarily educational content. But any government in our country that has given radio frequencies. And I speak as a former chairman of a regulatory institution. So basically, require <coughs> maybe the position stations to allocate a minimum percentage of their time, minimum 10% to educational context. That's not the case in most African countries. Um, in terms of the funding that is required for this, Ghana, under my, my leadership at the time as minister, was able to create a, a institution called the Ghana Education Trust Fund. It's the only one I know which takes 2.5% of the value added tax on every <coughs> household and wealth in the country to put into an educational system. So if countries really want to fund the new classrooms in the future and the smart classrooms, there are many, many choices. Uh, religious institutions, we spend a lot of time in churches or in mosques, and our churches and mosques will become facilitators of various types of educational content if we want them to. So there's a lot of dialogue that has been taking place between many stakeholders the business community, the government, academia, religious institutions, and other families. You know, what happens in most people's homes after, after formal class, class education? There's a lot of room for that. So I know this, uh, there's not much time for it. I'll be speaking tomorrow at about 9.15, I suppose, in the plenary, and we'll try to generate some of these possibly provocative um, ideas for, for discussion. I believe that the Samsungs and the Microsofts and the Facebooks are all ready to play various roles in supporting educational infrastructure if they are required or requested and government policies and, and laws and tax that let you know incentive systems. All of this Zuckerberg was in the US Congress, I think for seven hours yesterday, as people were talking to about what Facebook, for example, is doing right or wrong with regards to political messaging. And all of us who are consumers of Facebook or LinkedIn and social media, Instagram, we could make all kinds of requests of them even to UNESCO, our international Organizations where we are represented, and we should require them to do certain things. So, to the international community, where most African countries are also members. So, I see a lot of potential, and so much as there are differentials now in, in terms of cost and pricing and technology, um, with creative thinking outside of the box, we shall bridge the gap. Thank you. Yes, you have a question. Good morning. Uh, my name is this morning we heard about many different things in the plenary uh, opening. But first, uh, in Nigeria, we had $120 per student. Yeah. Then we had another, that there is a push strategy, and then there is the pull strategy. Now I address my question to Matthias, because okay. I think I uh, love very much all your slides uh, and your sense. And I think there is a pull 
for a new pedagogy. And I, but I also think that is the cheap way to learn. Let's focus on the pedagogy. Let's focus to develop a case of what what's called the problem and project and exemplary project pedagogy, and then change the classroom in the line that you are changing it, and then find out to build up the learning infrastructure and the tools to use. And for sure, a lot of educators, they already have these dreams about changing. And we can do it, and we don't need a lot of expensive equipment. We can do a lot from the equipment we already have. We can have organized this room a little bit different, and we think we can create a very different kind of experience for all of us. So my yeah. it's comment. It this was more a comment, I appreciate that. Okay, just one last comment, and then we can, we can pick up on those. I think one, uh, everyone, um, everyone in has three minutes just to wrap up on, on their thoughts about the future of education on the panel. Yeah, mine's a comment on the question actually. Yeah. I think um, it seems a lot of what we've been thinking about in particular from the UNESCO side and from the, you know, the business side of things is quite top down. And my experience in Africa and I've you know, given some training in rural African schools and stuff, there are two things to note. There are some tech, I live in Rwanda, Rwanda is heavily invested in technology uh, and they have little laptops, etc. etc. I go to rural schools and rural communities that have got no electricity, um, so the laptops are sitting in a, in a, you know, uncovered, <laughs> they're not being used, yep. that's the first thing. Yeah. Second comment to make is that I think that you mentioned about teachers and we're talking about changing right away this kind of thing. In my experience, and I, you know, I'm, I'm teaching myself at its origin, teachers are quite slow to change and slow to adopt mm -hmm. new technologies, so I think there needs to be much more emphasis in terms of getting teacher buy-in at a local level and you know, more bottom-up strategies rather than this kind of top-down approach sort of thing. That's just my point, basically. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, thank you for the starting. I know that it's not much finished on Thursday, but people are leaving. I think they're getting hungry. So let's um, ask, um, I'll start with, um, okay, I'll start with Matthias. We'll go backwards, so you the first thing so you can go last. Okay, Matthias. Okay, just brilliant. So first okay. thing, thing. So thank you so much for, 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 for being here. I, I first would like to apologize my French, right? So I'll, I'll go that again. Uh, and again, the, the objective was not to kind of give the impression that it's a top-down approach. Uh, every single project that you've seen over here was led by student teachers in the local community to help guide what is going to be the right solution for now. So the pictures of the classrooms, everything was done, they designed it. We were just to empower and enable them. So it was actually all the way around. It was uh, not a pull, it was a push strategy. So we made sure that the school in South Africa was designed by them. Uh, they selected the school, but it does not have power, does not have security, does not have transport to get to that school. It, it's in the middle of nowhere. The reason why we selected that school is because the Department of Basic Education of South Africa was trying to put the pilot in Johannesburg, which is easy. He said, hmm, that's the most difficult one. Right? And if we design the solution for the most difficult one, bottoms up. So that teacher is the one that would that really kind of we really face in the beginning. This does not work. It will take me a long time. I've never used technology before. It's the same guy that is jumping on that screen, smiling at the kids all over on his feet. So they designed the solution, they put it out together. All the components that it were relevant for them, they themselves mapped, put it How long did that take? Was that a long process? We, we started that uh, precisely 14 months ago. Precisely 14 months ago. We've been planning a year before that to put all of that together. So execution is not precisely 14 months ago, it's on execution. By the way, that those flashlights were on metal containers. And uh, the Department of Education was building new buildings that did not have even the power on it. When they put the power outlets, the bookshelves, it, it's tough to see, but the bookshelves cover that. So you do not have access to the power outlets on those rooms. So there's a lot of components that need to change. And again, it's a completely top-down approach. Right. So uh, I'm sorry, bottom bottles up approach. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, the formats that I put, that doesn't mean that that's how yours will look like. That's just an idea. That's just to show what can be done. That doesn't mean that VR, AR, and XR is going to be the solution for it. But it's a tool available in your portfolio. And all of that 
It's the tools that you have access to. They can start transforming education now. Raise a hand, let us know, and we're here to help you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for the opportunity to address you here today. I'd just like to leave you with um, this invitation to join this conversation that we're starting about the futures of education. I know that sometimes when people invite input that can be more rhetorical than sort of a, a purpose or that there's real meaning behind it, but I want to assure you that the mechanisms we have set up for you to submit your ideas are real. We will consider uh, the opinions that are received from us, or fr from you and from your organizations. If you're interested in leading a consultation, I'd love to hear from you. So to the point about top up versus bottom down, look, we, we can't lie. UNESCO is an organization of and by governments. That's for sure. But what we can do is we can source, and what we're trying to do is source ideas from many different walks of life, from many different countries, and to bring those to education leaders. And we have a former minister of education from Ghana in the room, and I, we had a conversation just yesterday. Of course he knows UNESCO. It, every minister of education knows UNESCO. And I think on our side, we have a commitment to bring these new values, these new understandings, these new futures for education to the international community, to world leaders. And so that's a powerful vehicle, and we hope that you will engage in this process. Thank and you. Just to say one thing, We are doing a lot to reach out to, 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 to youth, absolutely. But we again, we need your help. We hope that if you can lead a consultation with young people, whether it be in Rwanda or I'm not sure where you're based, Canada. in Canada, that would be excellent. I mean, we, we, we invite that and look forward to those, uh, those contributions. Yeah, just I think, for example, right? So that, that, that our this exercise that I put it, we were actually work with Mark in Indonesia, and uh, the, the first pool of students that we did interview was all the students there. That was one of the 50% of our Stephen, okay. thank you. So, um, I feel a bit blindsided by the salesperson in the room, frankly. I'll sit down. Um, <laughs> we won't sit down and won't shut up. Uh, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, we were here to talk about the future of education. If I had known the direction this was going to go, I would have talked a lot more about open source. I would have talked a lot more about open content. I would have talked a lot more about communities creating the materials and the resources to support their own education rather than buying it from slick salespeople. Uh, you know, those computers piled up, covered in dust, were sold by a computer company. And they made money, and they made money by promising a future. And my experience is, you know, other people can't promise you a future. Um, and, and, you know, other people, especially people who, who have products to sell, um, especially people who view the world as a competitive marketplace are looking to win rather than help. Um, and maybe that's just my reaction, maybe it's just the jet lag. Um, but, but that's my feeling right now. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of disappointed by this. I, I wanted to focus on, well, you know, here's some neat ideas about where this is going to go in the future. Um, but, you know, and, and I think I'm a bit different even from Mark from UNESCO in the sense that I don't have anything to sell, not even a book. Um, you know, I don't, you know, nothing like that. So I'm just giving you my observations. Um, I wish, you know, in, in consultations, uh, there's like half the planet now is on mobile phones. They have access. Use that and get the input from them directly. When it gets filtered through layer after layer after layer, by the time it gets to the UNESCO level, it looks like the corporate message. And I've read tons of UNESCO documents. I read the Futures of Education document, um, which wasn't a bad document, um, but you know, it, it had as you know. 
a certain perspective on you know it's it's education as opposed to learning right um, it's it's you know it, it's I don't want to say acquiring content because that's not right but when I think when I read something like uh, becoming right I think of oh we're finally beginning to understand that the product of an education is a person not a skill set not a body of knowledge right that, that to learn is to actually grow and develop physically and as somebody pointed out there are so many other influences besides school um, you know I was in, in a taxi uh, getting clothes because my luggage is somewhere in I don't know Egypt uh, and the the radio in the taxi was non-stop on a certain channel uh, I think it was the Catholic channel the whole time that's education right the the radio playing in the taxi for this guy 18 hours a day is education and that's the education he's getting and that's the sort of thing that as a society um, we all need to look at I agree education should be about commonality in the sense that it's not about making us better at competing against each other but education also needs to be about you know pursuing our own path honoring our own heritage and our own culture doing our own thing our own way this is my belief anyway so and and I and I hope it's your belief maybe it's not but I hope it is it's not about all of us being the same it's about all of us being different in the way that we're best at being different and still getting along not killing each other and having peaceful prosperous lives becoming whatever it is that we want to become you can't buy that you can't pay money for that uh, it's it's not a dream that you can sell to people it's only something that we as individuals can build for ourselves and that's my feeling Thank you. Thanks, everyone.